with the open internet rules address inter interconnection issues, a topic that was addressed in the Brazilian regulation more than 10 years before Marcos Zero. Why do you think interconnection was not a big issue in the US until the Netflix versus Comcast deal? That's actually a really interesting question. So I think there are a number of reasons for that. So first, when we first started to think about network neutrality, we focused on what's happening on the end user's access network because that was the most obvious choice. You know, deep packet inspection technology had become available. ISPs were involved in blocking. Um, the head of SPC said, I want to charge Google and Facebook and all the applications for access to my users. So that drove the debate. By contrast, most ISPs were small and as a result were buying transit to the internet. So there was never a problem of ISPs charging anybody to get access to their users because the ISPs were paying to get access to the internet. So it just wasn't a problem. So then a couple of things happened. First, we actually got sort of First, we had informal network neutrality rules, then sort of a mix of formal and informal regulations. So even before 2010, we actually had real network neutrality rules in the US, but sort of formally only since 2010. And they only apply to what happened on the access network. So all of this made ISPs very hesitant to mess, like block or discriminate on the network because they didn't want to attract regulatory scrutiny. So they realized, it's actually a really interesting way around the rules in the same way that you can block traffic while it travels over the network, you can block it when it enters the network at the point of interconnection. Or in the same way in which you could charge application or content providers for access to your users, which was explicitly prohibited under the open internet rules, you could charge ISP, uh, the content providers or the interconnecting networks for interconnection. So given that the opportunities to engage in dangerous practices on the access network was foreclosed, so the pressure to do stuff shifted to the point of interconnection. At the same time, the market structure changed. Comcast, for example, became a major backbone provider. There was a lot of consolidation among ISPs and suddenly there were large ISPs who controlled access to a significant chunk of the population. So when you look at what happened in the interconnection debate, in interconnection in the US, it wasn't actually just Netflix. So for those of you who haven't really followed the debate, so if people in the US started to notice when Netflix became effectively unusable. And it turned out that the reason was that not just Comcast, the major five to six major providers in the US were not upgrading the capacity at the point of interconnection. And as a result, the quality deteriorated, even though there was enough capacity everywhere. And they were saying to Netflix, if you pay, we'll upgrade the capacity, but if you don't, we won't upgrade. And so in the end, Netflix paid and suddenly capacity increased again. But it wasn't just a Netflix problem. So if there have been very detailed studies done by Measurement Lab and the Open Technology Institute at the New America Foundation has a very interesting report that sort of looks at all the data. And they show there was at that is sort of 56 or 65 million users in the US were affected by these measures. And by now, so if we were in a situation where you cannot get good quality interconnection unless you pay. So it's basically the flip side of this idea of if you are allowed to charge, you have an incentive to downgrade the quality of the baseline service. We see this in effect in interconnection. You know, and it harms users, it creates lots of problems, the internet is full of complaints of people who couldn't telecommute, couldn't access their patient records, long distance learners, so huge problems and it harms users, but. ISPs don't react because they want to motivate those who can pay to pay for interconnection. So all of these reasons led the FCC to ultimately determine as part of the open internet proceeding that any network neutrality rule will be incomplete if you regulate what's happening on the network but leave the point of interconnection free 
from any regulation. They were more hesitant to come up with detailed rules for that part of the rules because they said, we haven't really had as much time to think about what's happening in that space. So they just adopted the rules that says interconnection practices need to be just and reasonable. And you can bring complaints and we can figure out what needs to be done then. I personally think there is a need for sort of more substantive rules, but this is a very important first step. I just want to add that this has been a problem for a longer time. Even in 2010, there were problems in this space, but they happened right before the 2010 rules were adopted. And so at the time, the FCC said, let's just separate the two, look at them separately, and then they never got around to interconnections. So even though the public only really learned about this now, um, it has actually been a problem for quite a while. 